We're here today to talk about water issues and more specifically about the struggles to protect Fish Lake in the interior of BC um, and the fight to, to defend lakes across the country. That lake is proposed to be drained. Those fish will be put in, as I call it, into residential school and, <laughs> survive, and survived until their new proposed mitigation plan of uh, Prosperity Lake, which will be um, separated from the tailings pond, if this goes ahead, by a dam. And the fish will be put into this new Prosperity Lake. We need to protect our waters in any way that we know how. We need to protect our future generations. And for the Taiko Inn people, in 1864, we have done just that. Our people, our war leaders, stopped the road from coming in on the southwest side of the territory at Butte Inlet, where they were coming into building a road into the southwest side of the Chilcotin territory. And they were after gold back then. Again, today, on the eastern side of the Honeywoodine um, caretaker area in the Chilcotin, they're after gold again. With the Tsaikotin people, and myself specifically, our land is not for sale. We may have gone... I'm looking here at what they want to do with Fish Lake. This is Tasco Mines. What do they want it for? Did I read this right? To stockpile rock? My friends, there's 85,000 rainbow trout in this, in this lake. 85,000 rainbow trout. When they cut down the last tree on Easter Island, there are 600 unfinished stone carvings still in the rock quarry on Easter Island. They couldn't figure it out. And my question to, to you, my question to myself, my question to our whole civilization, are we smarter than that? Are we going to be able to figure this out and when are we going to say no? Well, here's a good time to say no. The mining company is talking about spending about a total of $4 billion. About $2 billion, you know, in the initial upfront costs and then about another $2 billion over the 20 years that they're going to be mining uh, for $4 billion. Now, they say we need this mine because there's gold and copper there worth $10 billion. Well, you don't need to, to you know, be, yeah, you're doing the thing. Be an MBA to know 10 minus 4 is $6 billion stinking dollars. And if you've got bonds or investments or a pension, uh, you'll know you'll be happy to get 3 or 4% return to you. For them, that is a 40% compounded annual return on investment. So if you're wondering why they're fighting for this and why people like the federal and provincial governments are supporting it, that is the kind of money and the kind of return. And in fact, it was brought in originally to recognize lakes that were already dead because the Fisheries Act applies to lakes and any fish bearing uh, body of water in Canada it says nobody can put anything deleterious uh, to the aquatic life in, into these living bodies. So originally the idea was to say, well, the, the lakes that have already been destroyed are to be renamed as tail, uh, impoundment tailing areas. Under the Harper government, what they've allowed the, metal, the mining companies to do is come to them and say, well, we actually want to apply to take a brand new lake and we want to uh, be allowed to turn it into a tailing impoundment area. Therefore, it's no longer a lake. Therefore, it's not, uh, it's not subject to the, the very strong restrictions of the Fisheries Act. And there are probably as many as 20 lakes in Canada now that have been named and are subject um, to destruction. The first two are Fish Lake, which you heard about tonight, and a lake called Sandy Pond in um, Newfoundland. And on June 3rd, we will be announcing the details of a court case. Um, it's coming from Newfoundland and from the Sandy Pond Coalition there, and it's a, a legal uh, team in Newfoundland. But it, we will be challenging um, Schedule 2 and the amendment to the Fisheries Act um, all, right across the country. And our argument is going to be that you cannot have a law and then a regulation or an amendment to that law that actually breaks the law, that actually makes the, renders the law irrelevant. We all learned that lesson in school that there was, we, Canada has 20% of the world's water. 
Well, that's only true if you drain every a drop from every lake and river and aquifer and make us a great big desert. We have about 6.5% of the world's available fresh water. Most of, most of that is untouchable. It's in large rivers running in the north and the notion that it's somehow we can access it. Uh, we would be, you know, an engineering feat the size of the Three Gorges Dam to reverse that water. So this, this notion of abundance has been a bad one. And we also have another myth, and that is that we love our water and we take great care of it. We don't love our water at all, collectively, or we would have decent legislation. We, the state of, of, of protection for our waters is appalling. We have absolutely almost no groundwater protection. We haven't mapped our groundwater, so we don't know how much we have in its sustainability. And yet we give free just about to any bottled water company, to any agribusiness, to any energy company, to any mining company, we give these water rights free. And of course under trade agreements, if these uh, companies are from another country with, with whom we have a trade agreement, could be the United States, but could be a bilateral, if we change the rules of that water access, they can, they can challenge us. All of northern China. 22 countries in Africa. Every single one of the 677 major lakes in Africa is in crisis. The Middle East, the Mediterranean, Mexico City sinking on itself. They've used all the water from underneath the, the, the ground. Uh, major parts of the United States. These are places that are what scientists call hot stains, places running out of water. So when we look at our country that is blessed with more water than most, although this myth of abundance has been a dangerous and bad myth for us to deal with, but when we look at our country, we are blessed with more than most, and it is incumbent upon us to take care of it for ourselves, for nature, for future generations, and frankly for people from other parts of the world. We have to name our water here in our communities, in our country, and around the world to be a public trust. The concept of a public trust is that certain natural resources, particularly water, air, and oceans, are central to our very existence, and governments have the responsibility to look after those and to protect them on our behalf, the, for the essence of these resources, not for the privileged few, but for all. Finally, I would like to see us declare water to be a fundamental human right, and we need to ask the question, and it's a very important question, is water a market commodity like Coca-Cola or running shoes that should be put on the open market for sale to the highest bidder? Let me tell you, there are a lot of people who think the answer to that is yes. The World Bank just put out a study that said by 2030, and that's 20 years away, uh, the demand for water in our world will outstrip supply by 40%. That may sound like a dry statistic, but the human suffering and the animal suffering and the suffering of the earth under such a, a, a staggering statement is, is too awful to contemplate. And it doesn't have to be like that. We can work towards a different system. And I deeply believe that nobody should be allowed to appropriate water for private profit while others are dying or watching their children die because they do not have the money um, to pay for it. So I want to say here to Marilyn and to um, anybody involved in this struggle that we are here with you 100%, not just in, at Fish Lake, but in all the sites across the country. We have no intention of giving up because we are with you water stewards.